it going? I'm Mike Indiglio, and today joining me is the wonderful, some would say incomparable, <laughs> Mia Reyes. Mia, welcome. Thank you. I am sort of, it's a, I, how, how should I say it? I'm privileged to get to work with some amazing people here at Schoology, but especially two very special women. I've got Mia today and Bridget, who's fielding the chat questions. Today we're talking about ending the year, and we are on a crash course destination to those two wonderful daiquiris waiting for you by the ocean, ending the school year, and then we'll talk a little bit about starting next year. So we're going to talk about some basic tips and tricks today. Thank God I have my colleague Mia with us to help me answer a lot of the questions and remind me of some of the product things that I've forgotten. Because as you know, it's not just a matter of throwing papers up into the air and and jetting out the door like it used to be. We've got some more duties that we have to take care of, but I think using an LMS, especially using Schoology, it makes the process a little bit easier. Yes, definitely. And we're also gonna talk about some things that we can do on our side to help you that we haven't offered in the past. So we've got some more options and more options are generally better. Before we get started though, since Mia, you and I have not had the chance to actually work together a lot. So I wanted to know, uh, what's your title here at Schoology? What do you do? Sure, a lot of people ask me that. Um, I am a product engagement specialist at Schoology. So really we work with our client success team to support them with product knowledge and expertise. So a lot of that is things like consulting on the platform. I might have done your permissions when you're getting started with Schoology. Um, and uh, just any context around the platform. So that's what I'm here to provide today. So I hear the term PES get thrown around. Yes. I also hear CSM a yes. whole bunch. And back in the day, I heard account manager a, mm -hmm. whole, a whole bunch. So kind of let's talk about that nomenclature. Let's get it all clear for everybody. Who? What is the difference between our PES, our CSM? Is the account manager a thing anymore? And the best question of all, when people have issues, who do we talk to first? <laughs> yes. So I wish I had a whiteboard behind me so I can draw a diagram. You have a blue screen. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, there's not really such a thing as an account manager in title. Um, but every enterprise client does have a client success manager um, who is your main contact at Schoology. So any issues, questions, um, anything related to billing or buying PD, um, your client success manager is your main point of contact. And then internally, there is a team of people to support you that work behind the scenes along with your client success manager. So I'm one of them, I'm a product engagement specialist. So I am a subject matter expert on the platform. We have some people who are subject matter experts on um, our SIS integrations and bringing data in, such as our um, implementation engineers. So really there's this whole team behind the scenes working to support you in um, onboarding Schoology and rolling it out, um, but your client success manager is, or CSM is your main point of contact. So something's broken in one of my courses, a link's not working, something like that. I should talk to support. Yes. But my, my sync didn't, my sync wasn't correct. All of my courses didn't get brought in. I should contact. I would say client success manager. Your CSM. So yes. anytime in the past where you were dealing with an account manager, is it safe to say that that is your CSM? Exactly. So um, in our help center documentation, you might see account manager. Um, we're definitely working on gradually making sure that it's updated to your client success contact or your client success manager. So should everyone email you personally if they have any problems? Is that, the, is no. that what we're saying? No, okay. <laughs> no. Your CSM is your basic touch point. So all the things we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about rolling over, not just for individual instructors and some of the things that you can do as an individual instructor to set yourself up for next year, but also some things that your system admins are gonna be working on. And so system admins specifically are the people who might have a touch point with your CSM to get things working smoothly. Mm -hmm. Is all of that fair to say? Yes. Excellent. So. Let's go ahead and share my screen again. Welcome to Schoology Leap. Once again, I'm Mike Indeglio. Mia, thank you again for being with me today. We do Leap Live, so engage with us. If you have any questions or comments, like I mentioned, Bridget's gonna be in the chat and she's gonna be letting us know any, uh, any questions that we can help you with. Thanks for joining us today. So we're talking about the best practices for ending the year right with Schoology. Here's our quick agenda for today. We're gonna to talk about final grades, frequently asked questions, some 
errors that people run into or some issues that we can we can help you through. And, and, and my favorite shortcut on all of Schoology, which is the bulk edit, we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to talk about course archives. What are they? How should you be using them? How should you maybe not be using them? We'll talk about system settings check for the system admin. We'll talk about some ideas at the end of the year, some things to help set yourself up during the summer, some different uh, grading period things we can discuss. And then we'll talk about some options for beginning next year. And then we'll take a QA, but feel free to ask your questions at any time. I also want to point out that, once again, we're going to be sharing this video. We're going to follow up with you. And we're also going to talk about some ways that we can help you out with a, a rollout package, a rollover package um, here at Schoology. And we'll, we'll share that information with you. Oh, there's also the rollover course. What we talk about here today is, is not going to be comprehensive. right? We're just going to kind of give you the basics, the starting info. And if you need some help, we can uh, put you into that rollover course, which is much more granular, um, self-paced, and then uh, you should have all the information you need. So shall we jump in? Yes, let's do it. Let's start with final grade frequently asked questions. Now, Mia, let's, I'm going to pitch this to you. Let's go, let's go ahead into our teacher account here. Sure. This is Dr. Hughes, and this is one of Dr. Hughes's courses. And it's the, the end of the year is coming up, and I'm going to go ahead into my grade book here. Let's talk about the end of the year is coming up. I want to point out one feature uh, before we before we do anything else, and that's mm -hmm. um, you might notice that as a teacher here, I have left some empty cells. So can you remind everybody if I have an empty cell in my grade book, nobody's turned, maybe the student hasn't turned in an assignment or haven't graded it yet. Mm -hmm. How does that empty cell factor into the grades? Um, so the empty cell will not factor into the grade. Interesting. So anytime you see an empty cell in your grade book, that is not being calculated in the overall grade. So we have a neat little shortcut that's very helpful. Let's say you get to the end of the year and you want to now mark these as zero. You now want a zero factored in because your student has not completed this. Yes. In each grading cell, we have this options tab. And in that options tab, you have the ability to mark all of the empty cells as missing. So now that goes ahead and automatically factors all of my empty cells as zeros. And you can see that that is going to affect the grades. So that's something a lot of people forget to do. Yep. And so their grades are not calculated correctly. And they find some, some anomalies when they're doing their, you know, comparing their scoring versus the grade book score. Mm -hmm. So that's one option people have here. And I, I, uh, I guess while we're talking about exemptions, exemptions, we should also discuss that anything marked incomplete that's also not factored in, correct? Correct. So that's the equivalent of an empty cell. Yes. And what about excused? Same thing. Same difference. Yeah. So these are really visual markers for yourself. Um, depending upon whether you want this factored in or not, I would recommend just going to the missing uh, and getting that zero in there for yourself. Mm -hmm. Additionally, in the grade book, I think it's important to note that you have a lot of filtering options that a lot of people kind of don't often overlook. Um, you have a lot of options there, as well as the ability in the options menu over here to go ahead and print reports. And this is also where, from an individual level, as a teacher, if you want to export your grades for, you know, to have a hard copy, a lot of people are still in that mentality that they want to have those grades. <clears throat> yes. You can export that into a CSV, in a spreadsheet format. But that's not the main event. So what, what are some common issues you hear from people who are, from teachers who are closing out the year with their grading? So it's kind of going back to what you said. I'm looking at my overall grade and it might not match what I have in my SIS or what I think the student's grade should be. Um, and a lot of it is making sure that you have the right configuration for each material. So that's things like having the right grading period, having the right category, making sure it's weighed properly. Um, and even though it might be tedious to look at these things one by one, we do have the bulk edit option, which allows you to look at these all at once um, so that you can save some time when you're reviewing your materials at the end of the school year. So you may have heard this before. You might have seen it in a previous rollover leap we've done. A lot of people forget this. And when they start trying to figure out why their grades aren't factoring properly, they go into each individual item and start looking to make sure that categories are enabled or are associated and grading periods are associated. And you don't have to do that. At Schoology, we're trying to save you time. So I'm going to go back to that options menu. And you'll see the first thing you have there is the bulk edit. This bulk edit, it might be hidden away in this options menu, but it is powerful. Mm -hmm. 
what this is going to do for me, magic, <laughs> is show me a breakdown of all of the items inside of my course. All right. So first thing off the bat, I can tell you that a couple of my <laughs> items are not associated with grading periods. All right. So right off the bat, that's an issue. Mm -hmm. I can see that visually. So all I have to do is go over and swap those. Um, I don't have a, a, a ton in here to demonstrate, but I can go in there and save those. And now everything is a bit more up to speed. So just that alone has saved me a great deal of time. Now we've got some other cool things in here. Do you wanna talk about some of the other things we can check here? Sure. Um, one of the first things here is category. So you'll notice that anything that doesn't have a category shows up as ungraded. And in some cases, maybe you want something to be ungraded. A syllabus agreement could be something where you're just checking to say you received a syllabus. But then there's some other ones like final assessment that maybe you do want to be graded. So let's go ahead and put that into the category to make sure that it gets factored into your overall grade. As you mentioned, since that was not associated with the category, that was not being weighed into the grade at all. Exactly. So that's an issue. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I'll point out, um, we may, we mentioned before, not only is category important, grading period is also important, we talked about that. But additionally, you have the ability to change any of your scales or rubrics from this dropdown, and you can see them all at a glance. And one uh, element that is overlooked a lot is this little green dot right here, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it says published, but you'll, you'll know by creating content in your course that you can have items be published or unpublished. So what's the, ramification of having an item that maybe was graded, but you went ahead and maybe unpublished it so it didn't appear in your course anymore. So um, the implications of that in the grade book is that it will not appear in the grade book either. So once again, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, an example of a time where you've already done the grading, so you assume that that grading is being factored into your grade, but for whatever reason, be it on purpose or by mistake, it's been unpublished. Instead of having to go into that specific item and republishing, you can go do it right here from the bulk edit. If it's flagged, it's published. If it's unflagged, it's unpublished. Simple as that. This is a great way at a glance to see all of this. All right, just to point out, once again, we're gonna tell you exactly what type of content it is because our iconography is static across the whole platform. You can adjust factoring here and you can add your due dates in. You can put those in manually or uh, I believe you can, can we jump right to the materials from here? <clears throat> I believe so. It looks like you can. Yes. Learn something new every day. <laughs> so if I want to go in and specifically now edit this material and, and change the due date or just remind myself what this material was, mm -hmm. I can go ahead and do that. And another thing I did want to point out about due dates as well, especially for those that are doing grade pass back um, with their SIS integration, such as PowerSchool or eSchool, very often the due date determines um, where the item appears in your SIS gradebook. So um, in the case of PowerSchool, if it doesn't have a due date, then it will not pass back. So you'll definitely wanna make sure that that is in there if it's something that you want to get sent back to PowerSchool. Um, so it's always good to double check that you have due dates, especially in the case of those with SIS integrations that are doing grade pass back. And as we see more and more of our clients using SIS integrations, I think it's even better to re-highlight that because it's something I didn't even put on our agenda. If you want those grade pass backs to operate successfully, you need to have a due date mm -hmm. associated with your content. Um, while we're here and while we're talking about grading and closing out, are there any other SIS ramifications or SIS tips for making sure that those grade pass backs where they exist are Successful. We could have a whole webinar about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, another one I will say is just for those SIS integrations that have category mapping, also making sure that you have the materials mapped to the right category and that you have your categories mapped in um, your SIS app within Schoology, just to make sure that um, things are similar between your Schoology gradebook and your SIS gradebook. As you mentioned, we could have a whole webinar about that. But if I'm a system admin or I'm in charge of making those category maps correct and I'm feeling a little overwhelmed or freaked out, I can talk to my CSM? Yes, that would be a great topic for your CSM. That leads me to reiterate once what we said up top, your CSM is, is your uh, 
first port of contact. So if you have any issues, you're feeling overwhelmed, or you just need a reminder, we got that covered for you. So that's the bulk edit. All right, I'm going to pop out of there. Let's take a look at We talked about unpublished items. We'll mm -hmm. make sure that you get those published again. Talked about that ungraded category. Yes, there are times that you want you might want to flag things as ungraded, but if you want them to be factored into your gradebook, you've got to make sure that they have uh, a category. No grading period, no bueno. Make sure you get yourself a grading period. And then points. Do you recall what I meant by points? Yes, the maximum points. There you go. <laughs> I feel like I'm being quizzed. <laughs> uh, I didn't tell you. I did tell you I was going to keep you on your toes. Didn't I? Um, so we also briefly can talk about uh, exporting your grades. We talked how to do that from the individual teacher perspective. Uh, it's worth highlighting that system admins have the ability to export final grades mm -hmm. from the platform. Um, if you are dealing with an SIS integration, that's not particularly necessary. Um, but you know, it's a case by case basis. If, if exporting grades is something you want to do, you do have that option. And I guess we should go ahead and, and point out where that exists. Sure. I'm going to uh, point, this is my system admin account. So if this looks weird to you, you're not a system admin, don't worry about it. <laughs> system settings. You should go to export. So we have the expert. <laughs> I've jumped to the CSM, I've gone right to the PES. Here's our export. And uh, so you do have two options here. You can click on the gradebook tab and export that um, through here. Really, what I would recommend is the auto export area. Um, so if you do have access to an SFTP server, such as the one given to you by Schoology, or you can request one from your client success manager, um, then you can export that here. Uh, if you click on export process, the processes here are a little more customizable, which is why I would recommend this. Mm. Um, and you are able to export those final grades through here if you're a system admin and you wanted to get that on an SFTP server. So you have options once again. Now this isn't isn't necessary, nor is it uh, particularly recommended outside of specific use cases. Correct. But, but it's it's worth pointing out mm -hmm. once again. And I don't, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but if if you're unsure as to whether it's right for you or whether it's it's strategically sound for you to to utilize auto exports be a great thing to chat with your team about uh, yeah and to be fair as well you know i want you to think that we're telling you to export because it's not going to be there and the final grades disappear it'll always be there in schoology but in case you need to export out of schoology to bring into another system or someone's asking for a record that resource is available here so talking about things, speaking of things disappearing, wonderful. Great segue, transition. Yeah. It's like we didn't even plan that. <laughs> we did it. Every year, towards the end of a marking period, you see that Pendo banner pop up. This course is associated, associated with a grading period that will end on such and such a date. It sends people, in, we're just trying to provide information, but it sends people into a panic because you've done a lot of work creating your courses, you've done a lot of work grading, you've done a lot of work. Uh, on the system. And I, I have to say, as an aside, just talking to clients and seeing the amazing ways people are building content in Schoology, embedding multimedia, and just really flipping the classroom and blending learning is just, it's, I geek out about it. Um, <laughs> so you don't want to lose any of that, obviously. And so this can be scary in thinking that your course is just going to disappear. Does anything disappear on Schoology on purpose? No. No. Even if you try to delete things, we keep it around for you and so you can access it later. So first things first, let's all take a collective deep breath. <sighs> Actually, was, I needed that more than I thought. <laughs> Your courses aren't going anywhere. Okay. In fact, they live in infamy inside of your courses drop down inside what we call the course archive. So let's go ahead and take a peek exactly where that lives. Okay. Now, one thing I think it's important to note when we go to visit the course archive, I'm going to go back to my instructor account here. Here's my course dropdown with all of my courses in it. And you'll see you have that see all listing. Now, if you is this your, if this is your first year using Schoology, you might not see a course archive. And you also might not have permissions to access it yet. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but the majority of you should see the course archive. 
So while all of the courses in my course dropdown are currently active, they're associated with the grading period or grading periods that are currently active, you'll see them in this dropdown. The moment that grading period is no longer active, they go into your course archive. So you won't see them. You won't be able to ex uh, have access to them in this dropdown anymore. But they're not gone. Let's go back to that See All page here. And you'll notice I have an archive tab. Now, I don't have a very robust archive tab, but <laughs> regardless, they are here. Take note, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, that you also have a deleted courses area. So even those courses you tried to delete, mm -hmm. as I would mentioned before, we don't let them just disappear. So inside of my course archive, I'm going to go ahead and click on this section of math. And here is my math course that was taught inclusive Oh, unfortunately, this is a terrible example, but <laughs> it would be inclusive of all of the grade, the grades, as well as the grading material. One thing I want to point out here, <laughs> raising my finger. Um, so my finger you, is when you <laughs> intimidating. When you first default, when you first um, go to the grade book, it defaults to all grading periods, so it might not show those materials that are hidden under the grading periods. So if you click there oh. and then click on one of the um, grading periods. Uh, the other one might be a better example. Did I get the finger again or no? Oh, you don't. There's not a, there's not there's a, not a any, good example. No, it's um, a very bad example. Oh, ah. it's all under no grading period, meaning mm. it's not getting calculated still have to bulk edit? into your overall grade. So you should bulk edit so that you do have an overall grade. We're just going to do it here. Yeah. OK, so now, and this is all happening in the bulk edit. Now, this flies in the face of what do I want to tell you next? A lot of people decide, because the courses in your course archive are, are active, uh, meaning that they all of the materials exist inside of them, sometimes people use archived courses to uh, adjust some content. Mm -hmm. right? So maybe, there's a, maybe there is a, an assignment in this course that I want to push to a, a current course I have this semester. So I, you know, I go into one of my folders and I want to go ahead and copy this to a course. Mm -hmm. Should I should I be editing materials inside of my course archive? No. Um, ideally, you should be saving materials to your resources and then making the edits from there. So then that way, in your resources, you have the most up-to-date version. And then from there, which we'll get into later on in this webinar, you can copy from your resources to your courses um, for next school year. I like to think of the course archive as a record of note. So if three years from now, John Smith comes to me and for whatever reason, maybe a college, this or that, needs to access a grade from an assignment he did in my course three years ago, I can access that. I can access the grade book of record, all of the information directly, or perhaps you're, there's an audit taking place in your district, mm -hmm. uh, you know, an educational audit, and you need to show what uh, course activity took place at a certain period of time. All of that is accessible in your archive. And if you fiddled with any of it and grades have changed or materials have changed, it's not particularly as accurate as you'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you can't do some things here and there, but generally speaking, the recommendation is to leave the archive as is. Yep. Is, this is kind of a fringe thing, but is it? have you seen cases where maybe uh, a district set up the grading periods incorrectly and the archived courses archived a little early. And then upon fixing that, you can bring the archived courses back. Yes. So that's why you don't really want to mess with them too much. Um, so that's the course archive. Now, in the alternative that you had just mentioned, I guess now's the time to bring it up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back into one of my, uh, first I want to visit my resources, my personal resources. All right. Now, a lot of people don't utilize these, but you can create new collections in your resources. And collections, to use a uh, an analogy we've been using here quite often, is that this, think of your resources as a digital filing cabinet. You can add a drawer to that filing cabinet just by clicking this button. All right, so maybe I want to call this my, my course locker. 2018, I'll create that new collection. And I can go inside of that course locker. And I, maybe I now want to create a folder for each course I'm teaching this semester. OK. I give, probably would name that better as to the actual course, but <laughs> we're just having an example here. So now I have this. I have a folder for each of the courses I'm teaching. So now as we get towards the end of the year, here's this English 101 course I have. 
Now, before this archives, or even after it archives, it's interchangeable. You'll notice you have this options button, and I have save course to resources. I can click that. I can select my course locker. And your folder. And my folder, thank you. <laughs> Correct course. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and submit that. So now what's going to happen is this entire course is going to be copied back to my course resources. Mm -hmm. So, and we'll talk about then what we can do with it from there for the new year in just a few minutes, but I wanted to uh, touch base there. Yeah, and another thing is if there's only parts of your course that you wanna save to your resources as opposed to the entire course, you can also click on the gear icon and save to resources there. So it's not an all or nothing situation. So if, you know, maybe there's some folders you're gonna redo or rebuild. And what's really nice, and I'll, I'll mention this inside of our resources area, we'll take a quick detour over. Notice that, let's go into our course locker. We'll go into course one here. Now, you'll notice nothing's in there yet. Uh, all of this gets done in the background, another another uh, queue we have. So well, I'll get an email or a Schoology notification letting me know when that save has been completed. You can also uh, check the status of that in your transfer history as well. Well, now we're getting real. You're going real deep. <laughs> you'll notice you have a transfer history here. Yes. Let's, let's do it. And I can tell when that transfer started, and I know exactly where it's at. Okay, so once again, trying to give you as much transparency as we can. But just to finish this thought, inside of my course locker, inside of course one, I have that add, add resources button. And look, that is all of my course creation content right there. So if maybe it's during the summer and you don't have any active courses. Maybe your school is connected to an SIS and your new course shells have not been brought in. Doesn't mean you can't do any prep work you want to do. Maybe you got your feet kicked up on the beach, you've got your daiquiri and you want to start creating some new content. You can do that all in resources. In fact, I'm going to real quickly create a really, really bad assignment. I'm on the beach. <laughs> I could maybe create a whole bunch of content I'm going to use. Then when the new school year um, rolls over and I've got that blank course, <clears throat> I can copy that in. Yep. Or in fact, copy it all in. Oops. There you go. All right. So that was kind of a, a quick and dirty um, explanation. I want to point out that we have a nice video that expounds on that a little bit more and walks you through it step by step. So. Uh, Go ahead and check out this micro lesson on saving courses to your personal collections. And I believe we'll share that link in the chat. Do I get a thumbs up? No thumbs up. <laughs> we'll share that we'll share that link um, in the chat for that video. We're all doing a lot of multitasking right now. <laughs> um, so it's important to note right here, if you're a system admin, let's pop back to our system admin account. The course archive doesn't do much good if you can't get to it. Right. <laughs> right. So Agreed. let's go ahead into our system settings. Just kidding. Manage users and then permissions. If only I had a PES with me. <laughs> um, let's, let's check our permissions. All right. Now, do you remember what heading this is under? Yes. It's under courses and it's under availability. Whoo. So it's like the back of my hand. <laughs> so right now I do have the availability for my faculty to see the course archive. So I just want to make sure that that's enabled. There may be cases where you've not made that available to your faculty, but um, towards the end of the year is a, is a time you definitely want to probably make that available. View upcoming courses is a totally separate permission. So we're not really going to discuss that right now. Um, implications of it are very different. In fact, I, I don't want my teachers to see that. Um, is there a use case? in which you'd maybe want your students to have access to the course archive? Um, in some cases, uh, for example, if you have uh, students that are preparing for an exam that need access to course materials, or maybe there's a course where a student is incomplete and they need to go back and uh, complete more work, then some organizations do allow for view archived courses. Um, most of the times in those cases, it's better to just extend the grading period by a little bit instead of changing the permission for everyone. So quickly, while you mentioned that, um, let me ask you a question. If I'm synced with an SIS mm -hmm. and 
that SIS has, has pulled over my grading periods. Can I, as the system admin, still adjust those grading periods? Maybe I don't want, like we had mentioned before, maybe I don't want my grading periods to end right on the, the last day of the marking period. Maybe I want to extend that for grading. If I make that change, is that going to mess up my sync? No. So you are able to manually adjust grading periods in Schoology. You can adjust that end date. So for those that do have SIS integrations, when you map those grading periods, it's just creating them, but you can still adjust them. The grading periods do not continue to sync. So that allows you the flexibility to change the end date for the grading period in Schoology if you need to. However, that does um, bring me back to what we mentioned before about how some of these um, SISs work with due dates. So just make sure that um, even if the grading period is extended and maybe students have some more time to complete that work, that your due dates still fall within your SIS's grading period so that they get sorted appropriately in your grade book, in your SIS. So you see that your grading periods that are school-wide are all listed here in your grade settings, mm -hmm. grading periods. And editing them is as simple as editing any material inside of Schoology. Yes. You find that gear icon, you give it a clicky. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said that before. Um, but it, now it's going to stick. We give it a clicky, and we go ahead and edit it. Now, will that kick back to my SIS out of curiosity, or no? This no. This stays inside of Schoology. It just stays in Schoology. Um, excellent. And note that you can add grading periods. And we're going to talk about some, some specific examples as to why you might decide to add a grading period. Um, let me check here. That's our system settings check. And actually, you know what? Let me go back a slide here. So we've talked a little bit about final grades from the instructor pers uh, perspective. We talked about that course archive, where it lives, how we can use it. And a reminder, your course archive is always available to you. So if there's something you created for a course four years ago and you realize you never saved it to resources and you want to use it in a current course, you can go back to that course, use that gear icon, and shoot it off to a current course or back to your resources. So it's, it's a really powerful tool to uh, store your courses, not just grades. And um, what's also nice, too, is that, as we mentioned before, all of the work that has been done. So maybe a student had a, just a, a great submission to an assignment that you want to reference years later to demonstrate to your current students a, a great submission, you still have access to that. And that's pretty cool. I think. Yeah, you know, it's a great use case. Um, so I wanted to open it up. Uh, I haven't really taken, I've, I've abandoned my duties of looking at the questions here. I don't see him. Oh, I got some flags. So let's see. Um, Scott's got a question here. You ready for this? This is when things get really interesting. Um, Scott asks, empty cells are sent to the SIS, and it's figured in there. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess he's talking about the zeros. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Scott is right. So some SIS integrations will consider blank cells as zeros. It, it gets tricky when we're talking about SIS right. stuff. Yeah. Um, my the, Sometimes my, it's even, sorry to cut you off, it's okay. even configurable on a course level where you determine how the um, empty cells are calculated. So for system admins, it's actually, is this actually, Scott brings up a great point. For sort of tricky little grading, um, how do I want to refer to these? Nuances. Nuances to your particular SIS integration, this is something that during PD or that during uh, expectation setting, beginning of the year or towards the end of the year, when we all come together and you come together with your team to remind people of. This is great. Uh, this is great information because grading can be affected one way or the other. I'm we were talking specifically inside of Schoology, the Schoology gradebook. Thank you, Scott. Um, how will bulk edit change? How will bulk edit changes handed over? To the SIS. <laughs> We're doing a lot today. <laughs> so how will bulk edit changes be handed over to the SIS? So uh, essentially, it's just a matter of how you're syncing. Um, if you have live sync, then changing those materials will bring it over to the SIS without you necessarily having to do anything. If not, then you'd have to go ahead and manually sync those items or sync all in the gradebook. 
This is a great question. This is a this is more of a strategic question. And I think it's worth bringing up. As we mentioned before, when we unpublish materials, they're no longer factored into the gradebook. Mm -hmm. So a teacher might not want students to have access to a test after a specific uh, period of time. So they unpublish that material and is the test no longer factored? That's correct. The test is no longer being factored into the gradebook. So how do we generally suggest handling that type of situation? One option I would throw out there right away is the lock. Right? You can lock materials, especially tests, after mm -hmm. a specific. You don't want students to have access to that test after a specific date. That's why in that court, in the content creation uh, item, you have the lock, which can lock that test. So that's one option. Yeah, and actually for the test quiz, I think it's specifically referred to as availability. Um, so as ahead. long as you limit the, I'm pulling up the settings now too. Um, Let's see. I think this is worth a worth a a screen share. Yeah. Um, so under your test quiz settings, um, you can select. Oh, actually, I was referring to a different term. Um, submissions. You can decide um, based off of that submissions option. If you go to settings, so submission that um, specifies when students have access. So you can choose a start and end date. If you're not sure what that start and end date would be, you can manually enable or disable. Um, so it's really up to you, but that's what we would recommend to use if you do not want um, students to be able to view that test. Um, another important thing is once students have taken a test, you might want to make sure that they can't view submissions either, just so that they can't see the answers after they took it. So um, you can also select no for view submissions so that once they take the test, they never really see those questions again. Yeah, I misspoke. The lock feature is for uh, assignments, yes. discussions, yes. those great materials. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, great. So Brittany asks, is export only for grades or does it export info like attendance and such? It is possible to manually um, export attendance if you go to the export and then click on attendance there. Right, so from the system admin perspective, you have uh, a lot of different export options. It's mm -hmm. not exclusive to grades. From the teacher perspective in your grade book, um, to be honest, I don't use attendance a lot. You can print attendance reports um, but there isn't a CSV export. What we've learned today is to always bring your favorite PES with you. <laughs> but don't call her directly. Go to the CSM first. The CSM will get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> I like to tease me about that. Um, okay, great. So let me. we just got a couple more questions here. Let's see if any of these are pertain or we can come later. It's a great, great question. So what if a teacher mm -hmm. leaves and a new teacher needs access to last year's materials? So a system admin will always have access to all courses. Um, another thing to keep in mind, we'll talk about in activating users as well, is that um, a system admin can't inactivate a user um, unless there are admins for their active courses. So there'll be a way to, um, make sure that an admin has access to a course, whether it's replacing who the course admin is before inactivating the other one, or just looking at all the courses in the system. So uh, we got a couple of questions we're gonna jump to in a little bit. I want to uh, talk about some other things first. Um, so we did the system settings check. End of the year, so real quickly, let's go ahead and talk about system admin duty of getting rid of uh, let's let's focus specifically on graduating students. Mm -hmm. Or this this applies to any students you need to get out of your system. But we're going to focus on end of the year graduating students. First question to you: My SIS is going to delete un inactive students. Does that pass over to Schoology and does it for me? No. Wow. Wow. So you would have to, and usually what we see a lot of organizations do is clean up users on. Uh, every semester or at the end of the school year. So now is a great time to do that. So what you can do is get a report from your SIS of students that 
might have left or are no longer active, and then use that to inactivate students in bulk in Schoology. It will require some you know, cross-referencing of different files in Excel, but you are able to do that in bulk. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you do have single sign-on enabled, by inactivating the student's single sign-on account, then they no longer have access, and then you can work on inactivating the account later. So we're gonna summarize a lot of that, the first part of what you said, to just spreadsheet magic. That's the term I'm gonna use for a moment. I like that term. Yeah, <laughs> so first things first, we're gonna talk about bulk in just a second, but sure. let's talk a little bit about first uh, doing it one by one basis. Sure. Because a lot of people in the, your managed users area as a system admin, mm -hmm. um, you do have this inactive tab. Okay? Yes. We don't like the word delete. Exactly. It feels scary. I don't it's like- too permanent. Yes, yeah, I agree. So we go with inactive. So from this, to, thank you for agreeing with me. Yes. Delete is scary. It's scarier than the banner that says, your courses are going away. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, these are already inactive users, right? I want to edit users here. Yes. And from edit users, a lot of people overlook this. Here's the course filter, uh, the filter, okay? So I have the ability, if I've been doing my clerical duties correctly, to go ahead and filter by grad year. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'm gonna, I don't know if we have any people in 2018. I hope you do. <clears throat> so I'm going to say 20, and a lot of we, a lot of people also don't know that you can change this. If you're in a huge district, you don't have to just go 20 at a page. So I could go up to I think like 800 or 900. I probably wouldn't recommend that. You might slow things down, but yeah. let's go ahead down to 100. I'm sure I don't even have that many. I'm going to filter that. So oh, turns out I have one graduating student this year. This will be easy. <laughs> Congratulations, Alex. You've you've done it. <laughs> so. Very simple, I can flag Alex, or if there's a, a plethora of users here, maybe there's 800 in my district, I can use this select all button. Yes. And then I have my select bulk action tab. Mm -hmm. And look at that, I have mark inactive. Now mark inactive is ostensibly sort of deleting, all right? But it's not, they're not gone for good. Right. So once I click save changes, I have the option to keep all of the graded and attendance data and I, can think of very few use cases when it would be a, this would be a bad idea. We always want to basically keep that. Exactly. For whatever reason, if that student comes back or you need to re-access re their data, you want to be able to bring them back. You don't always need to send them an alert that their account's being deleted. That's right. kind of a personal uh, strategic decision on your side. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we could also say, uh, whoa. <laughs> Whoa! That was, speaking of magic, did you do the finger? <laughs> did you raise the finger? That was not me. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and mark inactive. Poof, all gone, but not gone. Mm -mm. For whatever reason, if I need to bring said user back, you can notice in the inactive tab, all of those users are listed, yes. including Alex, time stamped when they were made inactive, accountability being huge, you can also who know exactly inactive. who marked yeah. them inactive and then why it happened. Okay. Mm -hmm. So once again, transparency and how can I bring them back? Make active. Yep. Just like that. Now, that's the manual way to do it. What you were saying before, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I just very well might be. The other option I might have is to go ahead to my export. I could then export my users mm -hmm. and then do some spreadsheet magic right to just select the ones that are graduating this year in a huge amount yes and then import that through the delete tab yes and then that would take care of it for me in bulk yes and the reason why you do want to run an export before you import that is that um, the import here requires the schoology user id which is something that is an internal number to us. So then that way you can use that file to determine the Schoology user ID for the users you want to mark as inactive. I think that covers that. That was awesome. Can I get a high five? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we talked about deactivating accounts, graduating students. Oh, but wait, I just, I just deactivated 900 students and they all have parent accounts. So now yeah. I have 900 parents in there. Oh, what am I gonna do? If only there's a feature for that. <laughs> no, if only there was a feature. So let me let me see if I remember. Okay. Because it's been a while. Cobwebs. Manage users. 
parents advisors yep uh, options mm -hmm. look at that export a list of parents with no active children mm -hmm. so that's going to give me a csv yep that i can then import into the delete tab exactly and that'll wipe those parents out of the system now Oh wait, that does it for me. I was gonna say if I have multiple students, some are inactive, but some are active, they wouldn't show up in that list because it's only D parents right. with no it's parents active students. Parents that have no active students. I feel accomplished and I've done nothing. <laughs> I have no students in Schoology, but that feels like a breath of fresh air that we've gotten rid of our graduated students and all of their parents. We've talked about the bulk filter options and delete via import. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's 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 move on. So let's talk about summer a little bit. So uh, just because it's summer, you know, in the old days, your school closed, the door got locked, and the only guy who could come in was the janitor and some other folks. But now things are a little different, right? You might have some, uh, maybe some content creation happening, between collaboration happening between staff. You might have some credit recovery options um, that you want to make it available in your school. <clears throat> what I think is important to point out is that, and we had mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, from system settings and grade settings, we can create additional grading periods. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that I have a current grading period here that I've created, and that goes until 2025. What this allows me to do is, uh, that's not really the example I'm looking for, but I, I could create, create a grading period here and just call it summer. And, you know, we could start that in June, let's say June 1 through whatever whatever what have you right mm -hmm. whenever whenever that summer period you want to be that's probably too late but regardless <laughs> it's a um, long summer school. <laughs> yeah I can, create, I can create that summer period so that's one thing when we had mentioned before that's not going to affect any of your sis syncing so don't worry about giving your teachers the ability to uh, associate additional courses now if your sis is how your courses are being created mm -hmm. and you want to enable um, some summer activity take place you also would, might want to take a look at permissions. Manage users. Ha ha. <laughs> you mean, I need the finger. So, um, <laughs> um, and in those permissions, we want to, I believe it's under courses, right? Yep. The create ability to create a course. Now, you might have disabled this because your SIS is pulling those courses over. During this summer period is a time to consider flagging the availability and enabling uh, teachers to be able, instructors to be able to create courses mm -hmm. so that inside of their courses drop down they'll now see the create button and allow them to create those courses to run any of that credit recovery or additional help or whatever the situation might be over the summer additionally that uh, pertains to PD as well if you're going to be running any PD over the summer or maybe PD at the early part of the school year next year before courses actually get running you're going to want to make sure that you can associate those courses, those PD courses, with a grading period so that um, they show up in the active dropdown of those teachers who are joining the PD. Does that all sound about right? Yep. Great. Um, the other thing, too, is we really highly want to recommend, I'm going to be getting vertigo from swapping back and forth, <laughs> groups. You'll notice that uh, Cedar faculty here has a professional learning community. Groups are a great way over the summer to enable and, and to encourage your instructors to create PLCs, to create um, maybe curriculum development groups. A lot of activity can take place over the summer. And what's great with some of the built-in, uh, like Big Blue Button, which we don't call that anymore. Conferences. Conferences. You have options to maybe run some PD asynchronously online through Schoology without having to get everybody together. That's a great way to help. And also, I think uh, I want to just throw this out there. We'll talk more about it. We're going to follow up with you. But when you're talking about PD, you know, PD can now move past to the just where do I point and click my mouse to create content in Schoology. We offer a wide variety of a, uh, PD developments. Not only that, but we have consultation services that can really help you develop a whole plan of attack. So you're not on your own anymore. We here at Schoology can help you and will help you and want to help you. Mm -hmm. Additionally, Some questions just to ask. We're talking now. Let's jump over the summer. You've had your cocktail. All right. I know we really gave short shrift to the cocktail, but have one or two. Enjoy the beach. Have your vacation. Have your fun. But when next year's coming up, um, a lot of people think about when is that first day of school. 
and have we, as we've talked about, that's that's the wrong question, right? Yeah, you don't want to be loading in your classes the day before school starts. So really, when is the when is the, what is the question I want to be asking? When do teachers and faculty need to have their courses set up? That's that's your start date, right? So you want to make sure that you're setting up your sync with your SIS or pulling in those courses via imports when giving the just you need to decide first how much time do you want to give your your teachers to build out their courses mm -hmm. and you want to plan backwards from there all right so when is pre-session pd um then the other thing to talk about is once those course shells do come in oh and we're going to come back to this for just a second once you do load in your courses um from the sis once you take care of your verify and reminder of singer sign on and you pass all the information off Restarting courses from resources. Once you have those blank shells, regardless of how your courses are brought into SchoolGV, imports or via SIS, they're always blank. Okay, mm -hmm. that's an important thing to remember. But since we saved those courses to our resources, bringing them back to life is very, very easy. Yep. But there are some tricks, things you want to do first. If you're going to be linking sections, you want to do that off the top. Yep. And also, you want to configure your grade book first. Really important thing I want to I want to say to everybody. If I pull in all of my content from my resources first, all right? None of my content will be associated with a grading period, will be associated with a category or anything. Mm -hmm. If I bring in my gradebook settings first and then pull my content in, anything that's, the categories will be reassociated and uh, any pre-work I had done will automatically stick. So should we take a quick look at that? Yeah. Let me go ahead into the course here. All right, so let's just pretend for a moment that this course was empty. Okay, I have a blank shell. Maybe I have a blank shell in here somewhere. I do. <coughs> ha -ha! Blank course. Ugh, what am I going to do? First, let's utilize our course archive. I'm in my archive. Here's that math course I taught last year. I'm going to go into my gradebook. My gradebook is set up. Oh, my grade setup, excuse me. I've got my categories, I've got my scales and rubrics, I've got my copy settings button. I'm gonna copy those settings inclusive of my categories, creating scales and rubrics. I'm gonna copy them into my blank course. Items have been copied. I go into my blank course, let's just double check. Great setup. Everything's there. So now when I decide to add materials, all I have to do is import from resources, select that collection we did earlier, find that course, select all the items, and bring them in. And now, my course is ready. And of course, I can go in and make any edits I'd want to make and update any uh, grading periods and scales and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty pretty easy. Um, once again, we gave that real quick run through. We've got a link for you for restarting courses from resources, micro lesson, and we'll walk you through it step by step. So this seems pretty self-explanatory, but it is a lot. And a lot of people can get overwhelmed. The question I want to ask you is, how can we help? So we offer a rollover package, which you can get in touch with your client success manager to discuss further. But essentially, um, the rollover package includes handholding you through the process of rolling over your data in Schoology, sharing these resources with you, um, and also helping out with any parent reassociations that might need to be done for the beginning of the school year. So we have this landing page here. You can go ahead and request more info on the rollover package here and your client success manager will reach out to you. There's some more information um, on this page about what that rollover package includes. Additionally, if you are interested in a self-guided, self-paced course to walk you through the things we've talked about and you get a sweet little Schoology badge, and a certificate, and I believe we're doing a swag raffle. Am I right about that? Maybe? If not, email me and complain, but <laughs> I think we might be. If not, we're gonna give away the shirt you're wearing right yeah. now. <laughs> All right, it's the only one I got, so hopefully <laughs> you can help me out. Um,
but if you want to join that course, I think I am I have the permission to go ahead and share this. So um, we'll share this course code in the in the link as well in the chat. Um, but join our course, get started through it. Uh, you might see some little things changing over the next few days, maybe. Um, but you'll have access through that through uh, I don't know the end date just yet, but um, go ahead through there and that'll help you through. Additionally, we're going to follow up with you with uh, a, a recording of this video. So hopefully we can you can listen to the dulcet tones of our voices and we'll walk you through this again. And the other thing I want to ask you is, are you coming in next? You, oh, you're you. asking me. I'm asking everybody, but I, I guess you can't answer everyone. Me. I am sort of. I think I am. <laughs> that's, that's better than most. <laughs> I think I am too. Um, so if you are coming in next this year, uh, we're going to be in San Diego, which is why we both definitely want to go. Um, I will be at next. So uh, come find me, say hey. I love to chat. I'd love to talk about what you've got going on at your institution, what ideas you might have, things that are working really well, things maybe that aren't working so well. Let's talk. Let's strategize. This is, like I said, we geek out about it. Um, we just announced the agenda. So schooldnext.com. Take a look through. Tickets are available. It's going to be a great time. It's always a great time. Mm -hmm. And we hope to see you there. So hopefully you've gotten some, some good info out of this session. I thank you so much for being here. Thank you um, for having me. I hope that you continue to join us for Leap. Um, Let's, if, you know, if you've got a few minutes, we're running a little over. If you've got to go, make sure the video is available to you. But if you want to stick around for a few minutes, let's uh, maybe tackle some more of these questions. Sure. Um, let's see. Can you save an archived course? Absolutely. As a reminder, I'll go ahead into my archive here. I'm going to do it very quickly. Like we had said, maybe I forgot to save my math course last year. That option, Save Courses to Resources, still available inside of the archive. And another thing to know about those archive courses is, as you mentioned before, nothing ever goes away. So even courses that you had from two, three years ago, you'll still be able to access them under archive as long as that permission is enabled for your instance. As a system admin for my school, is there a way to bulk archive teacher courses to a shared resource folder? Unfortunately, there is not. Um, teachers would have to go ahead and archive, well, save their own resources. But I think the micro lesson is a great resource to share with your mm -hmm. teachers, just so then that way they can see how easy it is to go ahead and save that. And another thing to know is that archived courses, again, will always be available and you'll always be able to see them as an administrator. So you don't necessarily need to save them. You can just always access them. Yeah, school-wide, that's probably not a, uh, it's a more difficult solution, but on a more team-by-team -team basis, or maybe even a, a subject basis, it's not a bad idea to have groups, subject groups, and then make it a part of PD or make it a part of a particular exercise to have those people saving their courses to that particular group. And then you'll have a repository of, of, of courses and content. Yeah. Uh, is the rollover course more admin-specific versus teacher-specific? Yes, very admin-specific. Um, I would say both. Yeah, both. Yeah. Let's put it this way. You wouldn't be, it wouldn't be unhelpful for you from an individual teacher perspective to go through the course. Couldn't hurt. And it's free. Mm -hmm. uh, does unpublishing a graded element also remove grade from the SIS sync? No. Yeah, it's, uh, no, it's a, that's more of a Schoology centric mm -hmm. issue. Um, but if you need clarification or you're you have any questions, CSM. There we go. Oh, we got some positive feedback. Thank you. Perfect. I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll just consider <laughs> you're talking about me. Um, is the assessment in a folder, you hide the folder, does that take the assessment grade out of the grade calculation? Yes. If by hide you mean unpublish, then it yeah. will also unpublish all the materials in that folder. A teacher who is living in the district would like to take their course materials with them. Is that possible? So uh, there's some options here. Um, you can export uh, resource collections as common cartridge file that can be imported into other systems and into Schoology. Um, what I normally recommend there is having that teacher create a basic account and then connecting with their enterprise account in order to save the resources there and share them with each other. That's great. Yeah. That's a great strategy. Um, how do you pr promote parents to a new school with their children? That's a great question to chat with your CSM about uh, and to develop a strategy. Um, when using single sign-on, they can't 
we don't necessarily want to make students inactive without their SOS, they can't log in. So I can export a list of parents who are children inactive for students to take away. That's a long question. We get a repository of all these questions. Uh, we'll reach out to you more specifically about that. Um, not trying to ignore you, just trying to. I honestly don't understand why schools you can't automatically make parents and students inactive based on integration with an SIS. Well, I think that's something um, from my perspective that um, in our help desk, if you haven't seen it already, there is the possibility to submit something as a feature idea. That's something that a lot of organizations would definitely be asking for since it would make life easier. So I would say if you have feedback like that for functionality that you wish the platform had, make sure to go to um, our help center and file that and submit that as a feature idea. So then that way my team can um, gather that feedback for our product team. Uh, can you review again how an admin can share a course with a new teacher? Um, so it's a matter of putting the teacher as the admin of the course. So I'm not sure if you're referring to um, a new teacher taking over a, a new course. teacher taking over a course or a new course that you're putting a teacher in but it would really just be a matter of going to the members area of the course and then adding that teacher in and making them an admin. Um, we'll just, I'll do you one better just while we're here. A lot of people actually don't know this. You can have multiple admins inside of a course, not, yep. you know, so the crown means that you're the administrator of the course. Blake here is a student currently. Um, let's say Jenny, maybe even a TA situation. In that gear icon, I can make it a co-admin. Okay, so in this case, as Mia said, You'd add the new teacher as a member of the course. You'd throw them, you make them an admin, and then you can even go ahead and then have them remove you from the course if you don't want to be involved anymore. Okay, I think that covers everything. So we did it. Here we are. We co we covered all over the rollover. So I'm going to once again ask you to check out that landing page. That's uh, schoology.com slash rollover. That's easy. Check that out, and also I'll re-put up the slide here for... So join the rollover course, get cracking, look out for a copy of this video coming tomorrow, and check out that landing page if you need a little bit extra help with your rollover. We have people on our side that will hold your hand and walk you through it with you uh, to empower you so that uh, you'll be better the next time. <laughs> or maybe you're a new system admin and you really need the help. We, get, we are here to help you. Speaking of helping, Mia, thank you for helping me. Bridget, thank you for being in the chat. And thank all of you. Sounds cheesy, but I really mean it. You inspire us. We appreciate you guys, and we look forward to talking with you soon. Thanks for joining us today.